Well, welcome. Bienvenue. Thank you very much for joining us today for the virtual pink tea conversation with the remarkable, incredible, great Sally Armstrong. Lucky us that we get to share some time with Sally. And for those of you who have submitted your questions to Sally, um, you're in for some wonderful answers and inspiration. And that's what we want to do today, to share the stories of some great women so that all of us will step forward and play our role in furthering the rights of women and in building Canada. My name is Frances and I'm, the, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Famous Five Foundation with my dear friend, Nancy Miller. And so on behalf of the Famous Five, well, at least their spirits, um, and on behalf of the board of the Famous Five Foundation, and in particular, the director of events, Preeta Kalar, we welcome you to an hour of um, amazing conversation and information about how you too can be a better leader or continue to be a great leader. We need to have everyone involved with uh, Building Canada and courage comes in different forms. And one of the ways we've seen courage is that that has been displayed by our Indigenous and Métis sisters and brothers as they have courageously cleared, as they have courageously cared for our land, which they now share with all of us. We are very, very grateful for that major, major contribution. And now it's up to us to do something because Canada needs all of us. And that's why we've gathered to have a virtual pink tea to talk about women and provide some examples of women's issues that may be tackled or have been tackled by the greats. So we encourage you to continue posting your questions to Sally and also to inter keep introducing yourselves because it's great to know who's here and I'm very glad to see some old friends and of course meet some new friends. I think probably a number of you have um, already heard of Sally and many more of you probably have read Sally's book and this is her latest book. Can you see it? It's called The Power Shift and it's a classic, it's a keeper. It gives us information not only about Canada but about the rest of the world and it gives us the courage to do our part to help build the Famous Five Foundation. When we began nearly 24 years ago, we needed a number of friends to help us and a number of corporations to help us. And we were particularly delighted when Enbridge stepped forward and said, we would like to sponsor your speaker series. This they did. They sponsored it in Sarnia, in Ottawa, Fort, Mc Fort Sam McMurray, in Edmonton, and in Calgary. So our thanks to Enbridge for that and for their ongoing support of our chapters in Sarnia and Ottawa, and hopefully soon in Halifax. It's my pleasure today to say thank you to Enbridge for their ongoing support with these virtual pink tea conversations, and to introduce to you one of their leaders. Karen Yuhura is a vice president and the corporate secretary for Enbridge, and she's taken time out of her holidays to record a message to us, which contains the formal introduction of Sally, because although we know many of her achievements and contributions to Canada, it's important that we listen to them again with a very grateful heart. So I'm going to turn this over now to Karen with thanks from the Famous Five Foundation for Enbridge's incredible support. Over to you, Karen. I'm honored to be here on behalf of Enbridge to introduce the third speaker of the virtual Pink Tea Conversations. Enbridge's commitment to our communities goes beyond providing the energy that is needed to heat homes and fuel lives each and every day. As a company and a team that is part of thousands of communities across North America, we are deeply committed to safety, vitality, and sustainability. Enbridge has been a proud sponsor of the Famous Five Foundation for nearly 20 years, and we wholeheartedly support the Foundation's vision to champion the development and recognition of Canadian female leaders. We share this goal within Enbridge and continue to work on our commitment to diversity and inclusion and to celebrate and promote the legacy of the Famous Five. I want to thank the Foundation for offering us the opportunity to connect 
and learn from outstanding female leaders like the one we have today. Award-winning author, journalist, and human rights activist, Sally Armstrong. Known as the war correspondent for the world woman, Sally has covered stories about women and girls in zones of conflict all over the world. From Bosnia and Somalia to Rwanda and Afghanistan, her eyewitness reports have earned her numerous awards for her work. Recently, she was honored with the 2020 Top 25 Woman of Influence Lifetime Achievement Award. Sally grew up in Montreal and she achieved her Bachelor of Education from McGill University. From 1975 to 1988, she worked for Canadian Living Magazine. And from 1988 to 1999, she was the editor-in-chief of Homemakers Magazine. McLean's Magazine came calling and Sally became their contributing editor from 2001 to 2010. At the same time, Sally was completing her Master of Science degree at the University of Toronto. Her remarkable five books are bestsellers. Her current book, Power Shift, The Longest Revolution, illustrates why now is the best time to be a woman. Sally's extraordinary bravery and leadership has been recognized with four Amnesty International Canada Media Awards. 10 honorary degrees, and an appointment as an officer of the Order of Canada. Sally Armstrong has inspired individuals all around the world to be agents of change, and we are so excited to hear from her today with the help of Denise Kokora. Denise also is devoted to creating better access and equity for socially and economically disadvantaged populations concerning oral health. She has been a senior leader in organizations such as the Alex Community Health Center in Calgary, the First Nations Health Authority in BC, and she is currently the Chief Operating Officer of Nations Dental. It is my true pleasure to invite Sally and Denise to start their conversation. On behalf of Enbridge, enjoy. Over to you, Denise. Karen, thank you and Enbridge uh, for that lovely introduction <laughs> and uh, our, our sincere gratitude over here from the Famous Five Foundation. I am so excited. Sally, this is going to be such a great conversation and for all of you, our honored guests attending today, you are in for a real treat today. Sally is amazing and I don't want to take too much time talking because she has so many wonderful stories to share. So I think we're going to dive right in because 50 minutes doesn't even seem like enough time. So Sally, I'm going to start right away because I, I wanted to start with, Francis presented your book a little bit earlier and I want to start there. We know you've written several great books and you write in your latest book, Power Shift, that in many ways now is the best time to be a woman. Can you tell us a little bit about this book and why you say that? Well, I say it because it's true. You know, it was the economist Jeffrey Sachs who first said that the status of women in the economy are directly related. Where one's flourishing, so is the other. Where one's in the ditch, so is the other. We know that to be true. And yet that kind of action didn't make the front page until more recently. And it really, in my opinion, made the front page because uh, the fourth wave of the women's movement, which began probably around 2012, this was a movement, movement of intersectionality. This included all the women. Instead of just some of the women in parts of the world that were, were trying to make change and did a spectacular job, by the way, this was all the women. This was black women and white women and brown women and poor women and rich women and able-bodied women and disabled women. It was all the women. And until you had all of us, we weren't going to make the change. Remember the wonderful Rosemary Brown, the the member of parliament from Vancouver, such a great dame. And she's the one who said, until all of us have made it, none of us have made it. So the fourth wave of the women's movement, I believe kicked this off because it made it clear that until your policies are written for everyone, our society is not going to advance to where we would like to see it go. But you know, Denise, this wave, I think also 
uh, gave birth to hashtag feminism because you can really use the internet like a, a speed dial for what's going on with women around the world today. And hashtag feminism brought us the Me Too movement. And, and I believe these have been the most enormous changes that, uh, that women have seen. And I think this is the one that got lift off. Oh, thank you, Sally. That, that, I love that quote. You, you shared that with me earlier and I, I, I wrote it down and I went, I love that quote because I've always, always believed that. When you shine, I shine. I, I love that concept. Would you say that same thing about women today during this pandemic, which has changed the world and the landscape, would you say the same is true uh, at this point in time? You know, I think it's really important that we talk about that because all of us, not just me down in my corner and you over there in your corner, all of us in the world are in the same boat. And the pandemic, in my opinion, has brought out the points we've been fighting about for, for centuries, really, and also the wins. Let's look at some of them. Uh, assault and violence against women at home has gone through the roof with the pandemic. Everybody's locked up at home. So those men who had been unable so far in their lives to control their anger, have now got their target in a place that she can't escape. The calls to uh, like the, the assaulted women's health line have gone up 400%. And, and we know this, and you know the police told me when I was doing a piece on this, when it first began, when the pandemic shut everybody down, the police said they even knew there were problems because they were getting fewer calls. Why were they getting fewer calls? Because she couldn't pick up the phone. So, so the pandemic showed us really writ large the size of violence against women. Um, but the pandemic also showed us where women are working. Women were the nurses, the frontline workers. They're not the best paid either, we could add. You know, years ago, I had to do a story on what women really did want in the women's movement. This is way like maybe in the 70s. And I was explaining we want the right to be astronauts. We want the right to be pipe fitters. And we did. And we got that right. But Denise, the mistake we made, in my opinion, was that we didn't establish credit for what we already knew we were good at. We were already exceptional at nursing, at teaching, at childcare. And we never did grab hold of that so typical of women, isn't it? We'll just, you know, we'll leave this part alone. We didn't establish credit for that. But here in this pandemic, we suddenly realize who the front line is, who's most at risk, who is basically saving the rest of us. And those nurses, well, people across Canada didn't stand out on their balconies banging pots and pans together at 7.30 at night for nothing. It was to say thank you. And now we understand we cannot restart our economy until we can get the kids back to school. And we can't do it until daycare is able to take children. I thought, there you go. All the things we knew we were good at are now leading the way back. But you know, there's a couple of other points about that that really, they, they really astonish me. Look at those chief medical officers of health across the country. So many of them are women. Dr. Bonnie Henry in Vancouver, Dr. Tam in Ottawa, Dr. Jennifer Russell in New Brunswick. These are the scientists who thankfully our governments have turned to to get the goods on the pandemic. And, and these are the people who I dare say are working 20 hours a day to look out for our safety. And, and these are our women who, who have stepped up to the plate and, and looked out for the whole population. So I think the pandemic has shown us the worst of, of our failures in righting the wrongs for women in that a, a wife assault has just gone crazy. We don't call it wife assault anymore, partner assault. But it's also shown us how women have moved in as scientists and are playing such a leading role in our society. Thank you, Sally. I think you've highlighted these points very, very well. The two sides of, I think the pandemic is showing us so many aspects of our society that may not have been as apparent, but are becoming more and more so. And those are two sides of the coin, you see, and, and still why we need to have more, more equality and, and more consideration of you women. Know, girls. If I could add something, Denise, you know, 
the countries that have handled the pandemic best are countries led by women. Uh, Angela Merkel in Germany and that spectacular prime minister in New Zealand, uh, Arden, and that wonderful young woman in Finland, I think she's only 34 years old, and her name is, her last name is Marin, Sanna Marin. The, the, these are the countries that did it best. They're run by women. But the countries that had the worst results, the worst, are the populist countries. All run, look, populist Donald Trump and the, the, that stupid man who leads Brazil. And, and Italy and Hungary and Poland, they've all had terrible trouble with the pandemic and they're all populist countries. So I think it's another interesting point about how women lead. So I can leave it at that. <laughs> oh, I think that could be a whole <laughs> other conversation that would be fascinating to have and to explore the, the leadership styles that we're, we're seeing and all the points that you just raised, Sally. And I'm curious because you've done such incredible work. What inspired you to be an advocate for women and girls in the way that you have? Well, I think anybody who had their eyes open understood that change was needed. You know, I remember in high school, I, I was an athlete and I played on most of the teams. And let's say basketball, girls played two thirds of the court and the boys played the whole court. I was a teenager and I said to myself, what the heck is that about? But you know, then I got on to university and where I went to university, the boys lived in residence, the girls lived in residence, but the boys didn't have curfews, but the girls had curfews. I thought, well, why do we have to be in at 10 or 11 o'clock at night? And they can wander around all night. We made our share of shenanigans anyway, but I thought, what the heck is that about? And, and then I can tell you, when I was in my third year university, um, my father died very suddenly. And in those days, it, when a person died, the estate was frozen. There was no money available for anyone. I don't know what they expected people to do, but we were four kids in our family and my mother trying to manage. And the dean of my faculty came to me and he said, I had to pay my fees, and, but there's no money. I mean, I was working as a chambermaid on the side. I wasn't exactly making university fees. So, so my dean came to me and he said, I'm going to take you over to the Martlett Foundation. That's the graduate uh, foundation at McGill University where I was a student. He said, you, you're a varsity um, athlete. You can get a scholarship. So over I went and there were loads of scholarships and there were many that hadn't been taken, but they were only for men. That was a big, big wake up call for me because it was one thing not to be able to play the full court in basketball, which eventually we did, but it was something else that I was going to be denied a scholarship because I was a girl. And then when I got married and they said I had to say, I would love, honor and obey. I thought, I'm not obeying anybody. I wouldn't say that. And a, a married woman at that time, you couldn't open a bank account without your husband's signature. So I knew as a young woman, changes had to be made and, and I was going to have to help the others work on that change. Wow. Well, we're sure <laughs> glad, we're sure glad you had those lessons early on. <laughs> it's benefited many, many people around the world, women and children. When did you first realize you were a courageous person? Because as we look at all of you, all of the things you've done, which are so fascinating, it takes courage to stand out and be that person to speak up and to sometimes and oftentimes say things that are not palatable for the masses. Well, I think it's very nice that you say that about me. I, I don't think I'm courageous. I, I am curious and, and I'm maybe a bit nervy. Um, I, I remember one time I, I was, well, I went out with Bound for my 40th birthday because I wanted to know if I still had it, you know. But uh, I spent a lot of time saying, one, two, three, go. I was so frightened. But I remember being on assignment in Liberia one time. I was with a Canadian woman called Sister Teresa Hicks. And uh, it, it was a very hard story. And it was a very hard country and a heck of a lot of trouble, a lot of uh, a, a civil war and, and a, a, a terrible man, Dr. Joe, leading the tribes. Well, Sister Teresa Hicks and I were going to go to another village, a, quite a long drive away from um, uh, Monrovia, where I was staying. 
and we couldn't make it through the night. So we had to stop. Well, her being a nun, she knew where other nuns were. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good idea because there was no place else. So we went to stay with these nuns. They were Irish nuns. They were quite elderly. I did wonder what the heck they were doing in the middle of Liberia at that time, but such lovely women. And in the late evening, they said, we're going to make tea. I wish I could do the Irish accent because it's so beautiful. But they said with their lovely accents, we're going to make tea. Sally, would you go and fetch water from the well? I said, sure, I'll do that. And I picked up the spout and the, the, the canister. And off I went. And as I got to the door, they said, be careful, dear. There's snakes out there. Just make sure you make noise. <gasps> I couldn't believe it. And they had, a, they had a cement pad outside the back door. And I would take my, my foot to step off that pad onto the grass. And my foot would come right back. I could not make myself go in the grass. And I thought, these elderly wonderful women are here serving their work. The least I could do for heaven's sakes is go and find them a bucket of water to make their tea. And I forced myself to go in the grass. So I picked up a stick and all the way across to the well, I'm going noise, noise, noise. <laughs> I was frightened to death. So no, I'm not very, uh, I, I'm not very brave. <laughs> Well, I think we'll agree to disagree on this point because I see you as tremendously brave and I'm sure everybody else here does too. So th thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> it reminds me of going through the Badlands with the snake stick when, when we were going to, to howl at the full moon one night. It was oh. similar. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> it was a great idea at the time. <laughs> and you've raised the point of some of the places you've been, Monrovia, you know, talking about all these places, you've gone to some terrifying places, some terrifying parts of the world. And we're wondering, how do you overcome your fears? How do you manage these places when you're there? Snakes are one thing, but... <laughs> <laughs> you learn a lot along the way. And before you go, you really do need to learn a lot. My son, Peter Armstrong, is also a journalist. I remember the first time he was on a foreign assignment, I said, remember, it's one thing to go in, but if things go sideways, you need to know how to get out. So, and the first thing that happens is they close the airports. I said, when you get into a country, figure out a way out. You do learn a lot, but you know, I think the important thing to say here is that people live in those places. They also die, but their lives have to go on. They've got to find food for the children. They, they've got to find, keep shelter. They, they, they have to sleep eventually. And you observe these people managing in such catastrophic situations that your own safety really does become a bit of a selfish point of view. But you do learn, you, there, there's places you should not go at certain times. You certainly shouldn't be hanging around bridges or, or putting yourself in the face of the enemy, as you do from time to time because you need to be near where the story is. But I'll give you an example of learning. This was in Rwanda. And I was covering the dreadful massacre in Rwanda from a place called Ruangari. And I was positioning my story around a Canadian doctor called Marie Skinner, because I, I always like to bring my reader or viewer with me and I want them to have a hook. And in this case, I thought, I mean, the, the, the disaster was so enormous. Could we separate ourselves from it? And I thought, well, if we go with Dr. Marie Skinner, she's a Canadian, we, and hear it from her, it will help us to better understand the size of this catastrophe. So I was staying in a little hut with her and she was supposed to have walkie talkies and she left them on the other side of the room. And we woke up at five o'clock in the morning, both of us, because you could hear this thump, 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 thump and deep men's voices going, hoopa, hoopa, hoopa. I thought, oh my God, we're dead. This is it, we're about to be attacked. I was terribly frightened and I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor and she was on a cot on the other side of the room. And she whispered to me, crawl on your belly to the window. I will too, but don't rise up. And if we can see outside, we'll have a better idea because she, she couldn't get at her walkie talkie. Well, we crawled to the window. We looked outside and she said something to me, I'll never forget, probably because I was so darn scared. She said, look, there's women out there. And if there's women out there, it means they're safe or they think they're safe. So probably we're not about to be attacked. And with that, 
the Rwandan Liberation Army went running by on their 5 a.m. fitness run. And that was the pounding and the hoopa hoop hoop I was hearing. So I learned from Marie Skinner, look around and see if there's other people around, you're probably okay. If there aren't, you probably should get under the bed. Oh my gosh, what a story. And having been to Rwanda, uh, I, I can appreciate uh, the, the feelings of being there. I just remember I couldn't do anything for that first day. I just needed to sit with the emotion and the feeling of what, what it evoked in me to be there and to go through the memorial sites and, and see with the local people. I was doing some work over there as well and it was, it was pretty intense. And so that brings me to my next uh, question for you. I understand that some of the stories you've written, you've been subjected to death threats. And we, we had a little conversation about this the other day. And, and, and you said you, had, you needed to share this, this story. And I, I'm excited to hear it because we were waiting till today. So I haven't even heard it yet. I was afraid if I told it to you, you'd be bored while I told it again. But I, I do have a story because I think, in fact, I was... Um, I was a speaker at an event at Harvard University last year, and it was, about, uh, it was about the terrible sexual harassment that women are suffering online, most particularly women journalists. And that reminded me of this story. My first death threat came while I was working at Canadian Living Magazine, of all places. It wasn't exactly a daily newspaper. And it came in the mail. And it was addressed to me, and this nice man used to drag these gray bags of mail up to our editorial offices and give us all this mail. And there was a letter, but written in words that had been cut out of the magazine. So it had my name, it had the address, and I opened it up, and the whole letter was using words cut out from the magazine. And it was pretty darn gruesome. He had clearly, or she, I'm presuming it was he, had cut the words out of the recipes because it said that I needed to be eliminated and that what needed to happen was he needed to listing cut breast in half remove skin pound till flat it was a hideously gruesome letter but Denise I knew what to do I knew exactly what to do tell my editor and she would call the police and that's exactly what happened the police came and they had a big plastic bag and they took the letter and dropped it in a plastic bag and off they went. And I have to admit, the next day, the police called me and they said, um, did you show this letter to anyone else? I said, uh, yeah, I did. And they said, how many people? I said, uh, let me see, there's four floors in this building. There's about <laughs> 50 people fighting for. They said, we're trying to get fingerprints. The so next time you get a death threat, try not to touch the paper. But the point, I, the reason I share that with you is they knew what to do. They wanted to find the person who had committed this crime. And you know, as my career went on and I was covering wars, I did hear from people generally from one side or the other in the war who didn't like what I was saying about the, their, um, their situation. And I remember one time on the phone, listening to this guy tell me that, describing to me the serrated edge of the knife he was going to use to cut my throat. I had a wonderful uh, editorial assistant in those days called Shiraz Bagley. <laughs> she used to call across the hall, hey, Sally, death threat, line two. We got these calls, but we didn't have the tools to trace that call. I couldn't look that. Uh, that number and trace this person. We didn't have any of that in those days. And so I was kind of stuck with receiving the call, but knowing the people around me wanted to support me. So I explain this because to fast forward, today almost every woman journalist is receiving sexual harassment and threats online. And nobody is doing anything about it. Google knows what to do. Apple knows what to do. Facebook knows what to do, but they don't do it. And what does that say to me about how they feel about the rest of us who are out there? So death threats happen. Um, I had one not so long ago, actually, 
I've done a, an op-ed for the Globe and Mail on these peace talks between, of all things, the President of the United States and the Taliban. If that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. And, uh, and this guy wrote on Twitter that all I ever cared about were the women of Afghanistan. I didn't care about the culture, and therefore, I might as well be dead. <laughs> I thought, what a stupid thing to say. Anyway, um, the, the bottom line in death threats is they are happening, and they're happening now regularly. And instead of telling your editor and calling the police, we're in a situation where they just go on and on because the people who can stop them have not shown enough interest in doing that. And thank you for raising that. What an important point. And uh, an awareness that needs to be raised as we encourage young people and young women and girls to to take up these vocations if that's their calling. We need to have those safeguards and you raise some very good questions and some, you know, for us to ponder what, what goes on there. And it makes me think about, uh, you know, you're talking about Rwanda and the wars that you've you've covered and different things. One of the questions we we've thought about is, how do you manage the sadness the trauma of the experiences you've encountered, how, how does that play a role? You've, de you've demonstrated to me what I think of as fearlessness. When people talk about fearlessness, it's you've demonstrated you, you, you feel that fear, but you do it anyways because there's a greater calling for you to expose and, and, and write these stories and share these stories to evoke change. How do you deal with that deep sadness that must come from, from the work that you do? Well, you know, Denise, these are scarring stories, I, I admit that, and they stay with you. I come home and those young girls, those women I've been interviewing, they, they play on the back of my eyelids, and I wonder what happened today, and, and, and are they able to get water, and how about those little kids, and I must say, they stay with me, but I do have opportunities today to, uh, to be in touch, to follow up many, 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 many people even in the most desperate parts of the world, have access to the internet. And if they don't, the, the person I use, use to translate for me, the fixer, that person can usually get to them. So I can stay in touch. I, I can get follow-up. And because I'm that kind of a, like a, a freelancer, I can go back. I can do a second story. I can find out how they're doing. So, And obviously, I don't stay in touch with everybody, but I stay in touch with several. And, and maybe, maybe that's my own way of soothing my own soul. But I can tell you, I've wrecked a few dinner parties in my day when people say, oh, they've been at this for a thousand. So I think, Sally, what, you, what you're saying is that I, we had this conversation where you talked about the, the dinner parties and that you will raise things because people say, oh, well, what, what's the point of addressing this? This has been going on for so long. There's no point to uh, trying to create change. Is that, is that what you're saying? That you still would, would raise these things and talk about it, even though it might not be palatable to do that over dinner? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can keep the kettle boiling, as it were, because um, you might uncover a major story, and then and as you watch it, well, let's talk about the women of Afghanistan. That's been a pretty major story in my career. I think I broke the first story about the women of Afghanistan under the Taliban. So now we have the President of the United States negotiating with the enemy, and it's True. Someone will say to you, especially military people, say, you have to negotiate with the enemy to make the war stop. But this is the President of the United States basically throwing the women of Afghanistan under his own election bus, saying, I'm bringing the troops home, and in order to do that, I have to say I, I got peace. And to, and to do it, he's negotiating with people who have done the most hideous, terrible thing about women. So I, I have been invested in the story of the women of Afghanistan. Afghanistan since 1996 when the Taliban first took over. Now I go back and I continue to do the stories, but when things like this happen, that's when I do op-eds or that's when I'll make a speech or I'll, I'll get online and call all the barracudas together and say, come on, we've got to gang up on the government and talk, 
talk about how on earth this could be happening. So I think um, as a journalist, you do have a role to play. Uh, you have to examine all the pieces of the story, but I think you can, you can follow it even when you are not there, when something like that happens. Um, well, I think that's, uh, and, and I'm, I'm listening to, to your stories, and I think that's very relevant because you are highlighting all of the things that we need to know. There's so many things I didn't know. And even in the conversation with you last night, I went, oh, I, I need to know more. And I need to understand and figure out how I can contribute uh, as well. So I think what you're saying is that you, your work, the passion around your work has been to speak about these stories to, rather than see it as a deterrent, you've seen it as an opportunity to educate the rest of us and provide the data that allows us to move forward with more mindfulness and with more awareness and also instilling in us that passion and desire to also create those changes within our spheres where we can and with what we we're, we're doing. Is that, would that recap what you've said there to some justice? You're very flattering. You're saying, <laughs> you're saying awfully nice things about me when I'm really going out there to do the job I'm hired to do. Oh, I think it's been more than a job for you. It's definitely a passion that comes through. I imagine your experiences have, have elicited anger at times. I, I, I remember how I felt when I visited Dachau in Germany and Rwanda and when I was in Cambodia going through, I remember the emotion and the conversations with women, particularly in Rwanda when I had those conversations. How do you redirect your anger? Because it's, it's something that is part of that process when we're exposed to, to those situations and what feels like huge and what are huge injustices. Well, I think in the first place, it is my job. It is what I, I love to do. It is my job to go out and an editor will say, find this story or uh, follow that event. And, <clears throat> and it does make you angry, but as a journalist, you, you, have to, you have to be a professional. You have to bring the data to the table. You have to bring stories that will attract the readers to pay attention. And, uh, and I, I I think, I think you can lose the, the attention you're hoping for from a reader by overreacting or using your position as a, as a platform. That's not my job. My job is to find out what happened and make sure it's accurate and tell stories about, in my case, people. I don't follow um, generals and presidents and kings. That's not my assignment. I cover conflict from the point of view of what happens to women and girls. So my job is to find those women, get them to trust me with their story because, you know, we're asking people to do things in very difficult situations and then retell their story accurately to my readers or viewers so that they know what's going on in that place. Then the joy for me is what my readers or viewers or listeners do about it. But that's not my job. And, and and I'm invariably knocked out by what Canadian women can do. To, uh, I think that's in, I think that's sport. incredible, Sally, because you have the ability to very clearly portray without, you know, with a, a real sense of a lack of bias, so that people can hear the story, seeing the world as it is, and then be able to formulate their ideas and opinions. Because in today's world, I think that's rare. So many people use their positions and as a way of influencing others one way or the other very strongly. And I think the data itself speaks for itself. And, and when you have compelling data, you don't need to embellish it greatly because it speaks for itself. And I would think that over the course of these years, you have met some remarkable women and girls. And I know we had this conversation and a few stand out for you. I know they all do, they're all <laughs> special in your heart. What, what are a few that you would like to share with, with our guests today? Well, you know, they all do. I, I've never come home from a site that I haven't carried the, the heart and soul of, of a group of people with me. I, I love that opportunity. I, I, I feel so humbled that someone will share her story with me. 
<coughs> now, there's a few, because we only have a couple of minutes, so I'll give you some examples. Dr. Seema Samar, she was the woman in Afghanistan. She's a hero for the women. And she, when I first met her, the first thing she said to me was, I have three strikes against me. I'm a woman, I speak up for women, and I'm Hazari, the most persecuted tribe in Afghanistan. And I thought to myself, you're going to be one heck of a story. Well, I got to know her. I followed her. I still follow her. One time, we were in the Central Highlands up in Jogari, and the Taliban, it was during the Taliban time, and they had stolen the generator out of her hospital. Dr. Samar had insisted her schools stay open, and her hospitals with health care for women stay open. Both were forbidden by the Taliban. The, the Taliban went into her hospital, they stole the generator. The, can't run a hospital with no electrical power and no generator. So they won for the moment. They shuttered it down. But she wanted to visit all her clinics in the area, and I went with her. So we're in one little clinic. All of a sudden, the door bashes open. You know, there's always noise when there's bad people. Never notice that. They, they should sneak around more. Bashed open the door, and it's a Taliban commander, and he's pushing an old lady in front of him. I'm probably older than that lady was now. Oh, but anyway, that's another story. He's pushing her in front of him. And he says to Seema Samar, she's sick, fix her. So Dr. Samar examines the old lady. She discovers she has tonsillitis. And she says to the Taliban commander, uh, I'm going to keep her here in my clinic overnight. You come back tomorrow. So he left. Seema put the old lady to bed. Gave her, pen I don't know what, penicillin or some antibiotic. She took care of her. She gave her a lovely hot tea, put a blanket on her, she took care of her. And the next day, when the Taliban guy came back, <laughs> Seema Samar said, you and I need to talk. You've got my generator. As it turns out, I've got your mother. <laughs> He's going to kill both of us right here. Anyway, they made a trade. They made a trade. She got her generator, he got his mother. They're always good. But you know this, these stories that happen in these desperate places. So they really stick with you. Eva Penovich, she's a woman. And I, that's another story I broke, I'm very proud of, was the gang raping of women in the Balkans uh, during the 90s. This was a dreadful, awful thing. Imagine rounding up the wives, the daughters, the sisters, the mothers of the so-called enemy, putting them in camps and gang raping them up and until they were dead. I mean, it, it, it was really hard to fathom. So Eva Penovich was one of those women and I was really worried when she agreed to talk to me. You know, you have to be careful. If someone has been raped, that you, you can't just ask them to relive their horrible situation. But I found Eva through a psychiatrist, and he brought me to her. So I knew she was safe, and she could tell me a story. But you know what, Denise, if we were on the front line, she was in a house with her two sons, her daughter, their spouses, and nine grandchildren. And they were about two kilometers from the front line. There were <coughs> rocket propelled grenades going off all over the place. Excuse me. <coughs> the house kept lighting up with the explosions and rumbling with the explosions. And there at a sack, they put the children to bed. And she sat there and told me what those horrible men, and they were called the White Eagles, what those awful, ter terrible men had done to her. But even watching her, I mean, she, she would be continually ironing the invisible wrinkles in her apron, and she'd get to part of the story. She'd stand up and punch her fist in the air, and then she'd in exhaust, and she'd sit down and she'd keep talking. She talked for several hours. All the time, this horrible, frightening stuff going on around that little tiny shelter. And at the end of it, she said, I thanked her so much, of course, but she said, you take my picture and you use my name because until somebody says, this is what happened to me, we're never going to get justice. I thought, what an incredibly courageous woman. Uh, and she's another woman and I'm still in touch with actually. There's, there's two girls I met who had been taken in Iraq, Bashra and uh, Badia. They were taken as sex slaves by ISIS. And young girls, they were 12 and 14 when they were taken, and they were 13 and 15 when they got away. And uh, they, they told me their story. It was 
terribly, terribly moving story. But you know, a year later, both of these girls, they're Yazidi girls, they hadn't been to school and they were both illiterate, but they got in touch with me. They found the fixer I'd been using. And they said to him, phone her, tell her we're going to go home to Shingal. That's where the Yazidis come from. And we want her to come with us. And I thought, how could this be? And, and uh, anyway, I convinced CBC to send me. And I went over with the photographer, Peter Bread. But thankfully, we decided we better go to Shingal first to see what they were going home to. Well, the place was flattened. I, I mean, you know, in a normal war, you want to take up the bridge and bring down the electrical grid. But when it's only to do with hatred, you pummel it till it's nothing, as though, as though you want to obliterate the past. That's what you're doing. And I realized that there's no way they could go home. So why did they call me all the way to the other side of the world anyway? I went back to the refugee camp where they were staying in Doha, in uh, Iraq. Well, the East, they were so glad to see us, you can't imagine it. They were over the moon to see us. And then I realized why. Because this had to do with truth and belief. And those girls figured out if I believed them, I would come back. And I came back. And therefore, they knew their story could be told with, with honesty. They, they, they said to me, so just like Eva Penovich, they said, someday we hope we will go to a court for the world and we will stand up and we will say what those men did to us. And, and to me, th this is such courage and bravery and honesty. And these are teenagers. I'll tell you another teenager, that, oh, Elena Podmorrow, she comes from Corona, BC, nine years old when she heard about what was going on with the women of Afghanistan. And that kid, she was attending an event put on by Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan, which is run by another courageous woman called Janice Eisenhower. And she listened, I was a guest speaker. And afterwards, nine years old, for God's sake, she stood up and she said, those girls you're talking about, they're my age. Someone has to do something about this. And she went home, having attended Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan, age, age nine. And she started Little Women for Little Women in Afghanistan. She took the story all the way across Canada to all those little kids. They made a huge difference. She became famous. She suddenly was the prime minister and off to New York being fed it all over the place. But this was the heart of a girl, a very Canadian story in my opinion. And she took her great big nine-year-old heart and said, I will not sit down and watch injustice continue. Oh my gosh. And I have to say, your own Francis Wright is another one. When, when Canadians needed to know about their own hero. Who was going to pick up the torch and make sure we knew about the famous five? It was Francis Wright who did it. And it's hard to do that. You have to believe so strongly in what you're doing. And then you have to hope you can get other people to pick up a pen and sign a paper or pick up the phone. And she did it. She got the whole country. And, well, I dare say there's not a Canadian that doesn't know about the famous five. And that would be the work of Francis Wright. So, so there's lots of heroes. And, and Rose, Rosemary Brown. Rosemary Brown who said that, um, what is that quote from Rosemary Brown? It's such a your quote, quote. Said, your fabulous quote. To be black and, and female in a society that's, yeah, in a society that's racist and sexist is to be in a unique position that you have nowhere to go but up. <laughs> That she was a great thing and a great spin on things and oh my gosh sally i could sit here and have this conversation with you for hours and hours and hours as we have done in the past and i i just i i want to just say i i feel you know moved and and just so inspired by what you're saying and yet so heartbroken at the same time that these things happen and it brings back a lot of memories of conversations i've had with the women in Rwanda and different things as they shared their stories. I want to ask a reader question because we're nearing the end of our, our time with our guests. And I, I want to just ask what motivates you in the face of all of these things? What motivates you to keep going as strongly as you are at this point in life? You are still full steam ahead and wow, you have way more energy than even I have. So you, you, you blow me out of the water with, with that passion and energy that you bring to the table. What motivates you to keep going with your work, your wonderful, 
passionate vocation. Well, thank you for saying that. And I love my job. I love what I do. And, and I feel honored to, to get these stories. And I do often say, this is it, my last story, because I'm not 20 years old. But then an editor will say, well, what about such and such? And why don't you find out what's going on over there? And I'm back at the airport. So I, I love my work and, and I think it's important that we know what really goes on in those places to women and, and girls. And I really think that women in Canada have been witnesses to the changes for women the world over because of people saying, oh yeah, I can hear you, I'm listening, I'm, I'm signing up to that. And it encourages me enormously. So maybe I'll stop soon, but not today. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want you to stop. We need you. We need you to keep shining your light and, and doing all of the things that you do around that. Um, what, what do you think our advocacy needs to be? What do you think that we need to be advocating for at this point? Well, the job is not finished. I mean, we have unequal pay to deal with. We have violence against women, which is costing $1.3 trillion a year. Uh, we have work to do. But, and I see Francis coming on, so it sounds to me like maybe we should get ready to do that work and turn it over to Francis. Well, Francis is pretty remarkable. I, I feel humbled in the presence of both wow. of you today. And I, I'm just so honored and humbled to be here and to be uh, a small part of the conversation and uh, in, in the shadows of you two giants. It, they're, they're big footsteps to follow. <laughs> So. Well, thank you, Denise. And uh, Sally, thank you. I'm wondering why I'm sleeping and why I'm not out there helping you more. Gosh, all the things that you have done. So Sally, I say from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of everyone who is watching today and I sent you some questions, and Denise, thank you for covering so many of the reader's questions or the viewer's questions. So Sally, I thank you by waving my hands at you. And I think this is Loved what you said, love you and admire you for what you're, you're doing as well too. And I'm sure we're all sitting a little straighter and feeling like, yes, we need to follow in Sally's footsteps and in the footsteps of the famous five, but of course go down our own path. Um, as Denise has chosen her area and um, is making strides there. So it is up to each and every one of, it, of us. And as you mentioned earlier about COVID-19, I can't help but think of the Spanish flu 100 years ago. Of course, I wasn't there. Then Sally, you weren't there either. But 100 years ago, the famous five were. And they survived, and we must survive. And they survived, or particularly Henrietta Muir Edwards survived a heartbreak because her only son died in the flu. And I'm hoping that she got solace from many happy memories of her son and of her achievements because by then she had helped establish the Canadian prototype for the YWCA, the National Council of Women, and the Victoria, um, the Victoria Order of Nurses. She hadn't yet done the Persis case, so that was to come. So I know, based on Henrietta, Sally, that you're not finished. And I can only imagine what you're going to do in your next 20 years. <laughs> I'm counting on you, Sally. And so that um, people who watched this today and been very moved, I must admit I had goosebumps a number of times and a few tears, as you mentioned, Denise. Um, we're going to be sending everybody uh, a recording of this session so we can watch it again and again, draw courage from you, Sally. And I hope you're feeling our appreciation for you, our admiration, our affection for you, Sally. Um, everyone's invited to come back for the, uh, the next event. Unfortunately, Denise and Sally won't be our featured speakers, but they hopefully will be in the audience. And um, my apologies, I haven't yet finalized who our next virtual pink tea conversation will be with. I apologize, so sorry, I've been busy with other things. But it will be somebody that's almost as terrific as Sally, and I say that because Sally's 
one of my heroes, but another great pair of women talking about women and women's leadership and the opportunities that we now have to lead. And by doing these uh, pink teas on Fridays, we're sort of putting a stake in the ground and saying, Fridays are famous five Fridays. Fridays are women's days. Fridays are a day of encouragement for women. And in Canada, unlike other countries, we don't have a Pledge of Allegiance and we don't have a creed, but what we have is a beautifully inspiring anthem. And so, as happens at important events, we sing our national anthem. And with us today is Jennifer Buchanan, a former director of the Famous Five, to sing the Famous, to sing the famous Five ballad. No, that comes a little later, but to sing our anthem. And so I'm gonna ask all of you to please stand and sing with great pride our national anthem. O Canada, true patriot love in all of us command. Please stand. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command with glowing hearts we see thee rise the true nor strong and free from far and wide oh canada we stand on guard for thee god keep our land glorious and free oh canada we stand on guard for thee oh canada we stand on guard for thee Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. And that's something clearly that Sally has done for years and years and will continue to do, as Denise will, as uh, many of you or all of you will do. So at the end of our program today, I have the pleasure of introducing an old friend, a talented artist, an incredible singer-songwriter by the name of Carolyn Harley. 20 years ago, I guess it was, Carolyn Harley wrote The Ballad of the Famous Five, which I think has got to be one of the most incredible songs and anthem for women, for others too. And uh, it always makes me cry. But today she's singing her second song, which is about the spirit of the Famous Five and the passing of the torch. And that's what the Famous Five are doing. And that's also what Sally is doing. She's passing the torch to all of us. Not that she's not going to keep doing what she does, but it's now up to us. And so on behalf of the Famous Five Foundation, I thank you very much, Sally. I thank you very much, Denise. Thank you very much, Inbridge. And it's over to Carolyn Harley for the spirit of the Famous Five. Miigwech, merci beaucoup, thank you. Carolyn. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn Harley. I'm a singer, songwriter, storyteller, and late bloomer. So 25 years ago, I wrote a song called The Ballad of the Famous Five, and I wrote it to celebrate the struggle that the Famous Five went through to finally win the person's case. And that winning decision back in 1929 changed the definition of the word person in the BNA Act so that the definition would include women. And with that decision, women were given legal status an amazing accomplishment for the women of the day. But I got thinking about all the heartache that's going on in the world now that needs our attention. I got thinking of all the things that still need to be accomplished. And so I wrote a second song, and I call this song The Spirit of the Famous Five. And it's a call to action song. It's a song that invites us to follow in the footsteps, the courageous footsteps of the famous five, and to find ways that we can set aside our differences and work together. 
to make the changes that are necessary for equality and respect for every member of our human community. So this is my song called The Spirit of the Famous Five. Five women fought the system, a system they knew was wrong. They wouldn't take no for an answer, they believed they belonged. It was an uphill battle, it seemed they could not win. Five women stood together, swore they never would give in. Heroes of mine, the famous five.